so grateful for these students. Uh, this is the second week of this series, Kids These Days. And last weekend, we talked about the significant uh, role and responsibility that is ours to bless the next generation. Uh, and, and I want to be clear, we said this last weekend, but I want you to understand when I talk about the blessing of God, we're not talking about just, uh, just saying, you know, God bless you as if the next generation were sneezing. We're talking about a blessing in the name of Jesus. And when you bless someone in the name of Jesus, that means your, your blessing is aligned with the will of Jesus. Your blessing is for the glory of Jesus and you're blessing them according to the power of Jesus' name. So this is, this is not just us, you know, passing out participation trophies uh, or patting people on the back. This is us saying, God has a plan and purpose for your life. And we bless that kingdom agenda in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. I was thinking about blessings, uh, and, and I went back in my mind to a story in Genesis chapter 27 of two brothers that were both eager to receive blessing from their father. Isaac was an old man in Genesis 27, and knowing his days were numbered, he called for his oldest son Esau to come that he might give him the double blessing of being the firstborn son. Uh, Isaac loved to eat uh, game that was killed out in the field and prepared, and, and his son Esau was quite the hunter, and so he sends him out. He goes into the field to catch some wild game, and while he's out there, Esau's younger brother, Jacob, goes in with a meal prepared by his mother, and he cuts the line. He steals the blessing. I want you to see what the scripture says happens uh, after that moment. In Genesis 27, verse 31, speaking about Esau now coming in from the fields, it says, He too prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. And then he said to him, My father, please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. His father, Isaac, asked him, Who are you? I'm your son, he answered. Your firstborn son, Esau. And Isaac, who was, his eyes were weak, he trembled, it says, violently. And he said, who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came, and I blessed him. And indeed, he will be blessed. What amazes me about that story is the confidence that Isaac, this father, had in the reality that the blessing that he spoke over his son would be heard and honored by God. But more than that, he believed the blessing that he invoked on his son was going to directly influence the course of that child's life. And what I want to say to you today out of that is parents grandparents, but even just church members taking your role of leadership in the culture and in the kingdom of God. You have an incredible blessing, a gift from God to speak life-giving words to the next generation. That's an incredible privilege that we have. And I want you to know you can say with the same confidence that Isaac said about his son, you can say, I have blessed him, I have blessed her, and indeed, they will be blessed. And I just want to even underscore that for the parent here today, that maybe your child's not serving the Lord, and, and maybe your child is 35 years old, or 40 years old, or 50 years old, but you can speak blessing in Jesus' name over their life, and do it with confidence today. I want you to see what happened next in the story, though. Verse 34 says, when Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry, and he said to his father, bless me, me too, my father. The question that I want to put before you today is this, are we raising a generation of Jacobs who can say, my father has blessed me, and indeed I am blessed? Or are we raising a generation of Esau's that are saying, bless me too? Bless me too. One of the greatest blessings that, that we can give to our kids is an environment that cultivates faith. And I want to just lean into that for the rest of my time here today. One of the greatest blessings that you can give the next generation is to create an environment that cultivates their faith. 
I, I don't know. I don't know where we got this I, this psychological idea of just you know self discovery at the earliest age. It's not, it's not our responsibility to just watch our children figure it out like an untended garden looking for a vine to grow on. It's our responsibility to do the work, to, to, to create the lattice and the, the, the structure and the systems that cultivates what is healthy in their life and weeds out what is destructive. Certain things grow well in certain climates. And it's up to us to create an atmosphere and an environment where faith can grow in their life. In fact, one of the, the greatest command, not one of, the greatest command in all of Scripture instructs us on passing our faith on to the next generation. That's how important it is. Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says this in verse 5 through 7. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Now, one time in the New Testament, Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment in all of the Bible? This is the one that he said. He said, this is it. It's greater than any other commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments I have given you today are to be on your heart. And I think it's significant that if Jesus says this is the greatest commandment, we ought to pay careful attention to what it says. And what it says right after the command is given in the next verse. Verse 7 says, impress them on your children. That, that's our responsibility. This is the greatest command in scripture that it first and foremost be on our heart. But right after that he says, impress it on your the next generation. Talk about it when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. What's he saying? From morning till night in your coming and in your going, create an atmosphere where faith can flourish. There's no greater responsibility that we have. I, I can't make my children serve the Lord, but I can normalize it. I can model that this is the way we live the life God intended us to live. I began to think about some of the parents that, that raised kids who they brought to Jesus. I want to be a parent that brings my kids to Jesus. I'm not going to leave it to them to find him. I'm bringing them to him. And I was thinking particularly about two moms that that brought their kids to Jesus. And what would those kids tell us today? What would be their legacy of faith? I thought about these two moms and how different they are. One was a Jew. The other was a Gentile. So one grew up with a spiritual heritage. She worshiped God, raised in the church. But then one day her life fell apart. Her husband died. And then her only son died. How many of you know sometimes bad things happen to good people? And I thought about the other woman. She was not raised in a godly home. In fact, her home and her life were exposed to demonic influences. So much so that her own daughter became possessed by a demon. And both of these moms, what they have in common is that they brought their their kids to Jesus. And that encounter changed their family's story. So just quickly, I want to show you these two moms. The first one is in Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, verse 11 through 16, it says this. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out. The only son of his mother... And she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. Then he went up and he touched the buyer. They were carrying him on. And the bearers stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. And the dead man sat up. And began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Wouldn't you love to know what the young man said? 
I mean, can you just imagine the scene? I mean, they're in the middle of a funeral and, and everybody's crying and here comes Jesus and he says, get up. And the, the, the young man sits up and we don't know how old he was, but old enough to speak, young enough to be given back to his mother. He sits up and begins to talk. Now, I, that's, a, that's a conversation I want more details on. Like, the, the rest is yet to come. I got questions when I get to heaven. I don't know if you come across scriptures and you just kind of put that in the back of your mind. and You go, I got questions about that one. But I want to know, what that boy say? Well, the truth is we don't know what he said. But we do know what everybody was saying. Because the very next verse tells us this. They were all filled with awe and they praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us and they said... God has come to his to help his people. So listen, we don't know exactly what this boy said, but I want to tell you a few things that I believe he knew. He had to know after having this experience. Number one, he understood this. Even if you feel alone in a crowd, Jesus sees you and his heart goes out to you. That's what it tells us in verse 13. I mean, his mom is in this procession leaving the city of Nain following the, 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 the coffin or the mat, as you, as you will, that they were carrying her son on. At the same time, Jesus is coming in with another crowd into the city. And now there's this crossroads. There, there's this congestion. I don't know if you've ever experienced that at an intersection, you know, where some people are just hastily trying to get home from work and, and they're, they're just trying to squeeze through the traffic, unaware of the fact that the reason there is traffic is because all the cars come and have their hazard lights on and little flags on their hoods because it's a funeral procession. And all of a sudden, there's this congestion in, in the middle of the intersection. And that's what they were having, a, a pedestrian traffic jam. And in the midst of all of the commotion, it says Jesus saw her and his heart goes out to her. Jesus sees that this is a woman who's a widow. Her husband's gone. And now her only son has died. She's literally laying her hopes in the ground today. She's burying her future. In, in this type of a culture, all of her, her confidence, her security, her, her future well-being would be dependent on the men in her life, and now there are none. And Jesus sees her, and his heart goes out to her. The second thing this boy must have grown up knowing is what all the people were saying. The people were saying, a great prophet has appeared among us. I, I believe this young man grew up with a conviction that God still speaks today. How about in your house? Do, do, do the people in your home have that conviction? God still speaks today. This is not just the, the rusty, dusty, good old book that we leave on the shelf. God speaks today. And that's not a small truth to come by in Nain. Because God hadn't spoken for 400 years since the canon of the old scripture, the last prophet had written. God, God wasn't speaking through the prophets. People were looking for the appearing of the Messiah. They were hoping for a prophetic word. But God hadn't spoken. So maybe his grandparents, maybe his great-grandparents, certainly not his mother. They had never heard God speak an active, live, prophetic word into their situation. But this boy, after this day, grew up with a conviction God speaks to his people. The third thing I know he grew up knowing is what the people said in verse 16. God comes to help his people. Aren't you thankful that that's true? That God comes to help his people even when everything seems lost, even when the enemy has taken his best shot. Here's the message that filled the streets that day. God comes to help his people. There was only one person he actually helped. It was this woman. He raised her son to life. But the people weren't saying God helps his person or this person. God was, helps his people. Can I just say today, the power of being a part of a community of faith is one miracle raises the tide of everybody's faith. If I see God working in your life, I can testify this morning, he can work in mine. And the testimony of that community and the household of faith that that young boy grew up in spoke clearly to him. And, and it's our responsibility, by the way, church, to meet people in the crossroads of life, at the intersection where they're laying their hopes in the grave. 
and to communicate these powerful truths in Jesus' name. He sees you and his heart goes out to you. God is still speaking to his people today and God comes to help his people. Let me tell you quickly though about the other mom. The one who didn't grow up in a religious home, wasn't a church attender. Her story is in Matthew chapter 15. In verse 21 says this, Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Mark 7 tells us, by the way, that it tells the same story, but it tells us the reason that he left and he withdrew to that region. He actually wanted to get away from everybody. He just needed a break. He went into a house specifically so that no one would find him. But someone found him. Verse 22 says, a Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. And he answered them, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Now, if you've never read this passage, this doesn't even sound like Jesus, does it? You're going, wait a minute, somebody came and they asked him to do something and he said, nothing? And then the disciples were like, just, just give her the miracle, send her away, she's bothering us. And Jesus said, that's not my assignment? I mean, come on. But the truth is, Jesus did have a specific assignment. And though, yes, the gospel is a whosoever will may come gospel, there's an order to it. That's why Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. The gospel had to come to the Jews. In fact, just a couple chapters earlier in this same gospel, Jesus told his apostles, only go to the Jews. And so when this woman comes to him, he says nothing. And then when they come and say, you know, just, just send her away, you know, give her the miracle, whatever. And Jesus said, that's not the reason I've come. So this woman calls out to him, son of David. That was the fulfillment of his role according to the Jews. But Jesus is essentially not responding to her because she has no part of that covenant promise. She's a Gentile. He doesn't even answer. But then look at verse 25. It says, the woman came and she knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. So the first time she comes acknowledging him for how other people see him, this time she comes saying, you're my Lord. Would you help me? Verse 26, Jesus replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Ouch, right? I mean, that's like, wow, what, what's happening Man, Jesus really did need a break. Like, he's, he's, he's edgy. Think about how different this mom was from the first mom. The first one, Jesus actually traveled 27 miles out of his way to meet her at her point of need. He had no other reason for being in the town of Nain. He goes out of his way to meet her need. This mom, on the other hand, she's from the wrong place. She's at the wrong time. The timing's all wrong. She pursues Jesus. She, she prays. And he says nothing. He, no response. Then she cries out again. She falls down on her knees hoping to get an answer. And he says, we don't give the children's bread to the dogs. And that term dogs is, is a term that they would use to speak about Gentile people. That were not God's chosen ones. Paul used the same term. He said, we don't give the children's bread to the dogs. And here's why I love this woman's story, because that could have been the end of it right there. That could have been the legacy that she passed on to her child. You know, those people down there that go to that church, they, they, they pray and they talk to God, but I tried that once. He didn't listen. They didn't accept me. I wasn't welcome. That could have been the legacy she passed on. But here's why I love this woman. She pressed in. She pressed Jesus a little bit farther. He said, it's not right to give the children's bread to the dogs, but look at her response. Verse 27, yes, it is, Lord. She said, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. It says, then Jesus said to her, woman, you 
have great faith. You have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that very moment. Here's what I love about this woman. When she came to Jesus with her need, she wouldn't take no for an answer. She said, essentially, you don't want to give the children's bread to the dogs? That's okay. I know who you are. You're the Lord. I don't need the bread. I I just need a crumb. How many of you know just one touch from Jesus is enough? Just a crumb of his grace is enough to meet every need in your life. And she said, that's okay. I know we're not first. I know you're not, supposed, you're not here for us, but we just need a crumb of your grace today. No wonder Jesus said this woman has great faith. In that moment, the Bible says, in that moment of her faith, her daughter was delivered. Let me tell you what that little girl grew up knowing. She grew up knowing that it doesn't matter who you are or where you're from. If you can get to Jesus, anything's possible. Come on, do you believe that today? If you can just get to Jesus. That's the atmosphere of this church. We believe that. Anybody, no matter what they've been through, no matter how long they've been through it, no matter what you've dealt with, we believe in this hour Your whole life can change, not because of what I say or because the ministry these students offer this morning, but because you get in the presence of Jesus, anything is possible. I know that girl grew up knowing that to be true. Just a moment in his presence can change everything. And I believe she grew up knowing this, and this is so important that we communicate this to the next generation. The right response to an unanswered prayer is another prayer. How easy is it for us to pray and lose heart? To pray and then give up. But the right response to an unanswered prayer is another prayer. In fact, Jesus has a a, a statement for that kind of faith. He calls it shameless audacity. Uh, Let me just show you this as we get ready to to close here in the next few moments. In, in, In Luke Chapter 11, Jesus teaches the Lord's Prayer. The disciples said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And, and so he says, when you pray, say this. And many of you could quote that prayer. He, he begins, Lord, here, here's how we pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And he goes through the whole prayer. And at the end of the prayer, he begins to tell a story. And this is important because what Jesus is essentially saying through this story is what you say is only half of the prayer. What's also important is how you pray. It's not just what you say, it's the persistence that you say it with. And so after he gives them the Lord's Prayer, he launches into this story, verse 5 of Luke 11. Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend and you go to him in the middle of the night and you say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine On a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers and says, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. Verse 8, Jesus says, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of your friendship... Yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. This is the picture that Jesus gives right after he teaches the Lord's Prayer. He says, because you're so bold as to stand there at midnight knocking on the door and saying, come on, come on, I need your help, I need your help, get up, get up. I need need your help. He said, because of your shameless audacity, he will get up and he will give you everything you need. Does that describe your prayer life? Just a a bulldoggedness, determination. It says, I will not let go until you bless me. Jesus said, this is what it looks like to pray and to keep on believing. When you, when you don't hear an answer, keep on praying. 
when you don't get everything you want, pray for everything you need. There's not a person here today that could say, God's given me everything I ever wanted. But there's also not a person here today that could say, God hasn't given me what I need. My God shall supply all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. So you can stand with confidence and with shameless audacity on the doorstep of heaven with your feet firmly planted on the welcome mat of prayer. And you can ask and seek and knock and believe. How about we raise kids these days that know that Jesus sees them and his heart goes out to them? How about we raise kids these days that understand that God is still speaking today? That we don't get the family dressed and come to the house of God on Sunday morning for a history lesson. We understand the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. That this word is doing surgery right now on our spirit. How about we raise kids these days that understand that God still comes to help his people. And we can believe for that. Even if it's not your need. We can believe God's coming to help his people. We're about to pray. God come and help your people. How about we raise kids these days that understand it doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter about your family lineage or your upbringing or your past. If you can just get to Jesus, anything's possible. If we can just get to Jesus. How about we raise kids these days that understand the right response to an unanswered prayer is pray again. Pray again. The heavens are not brass. God's ear is not closed. Ask and keep asking. Seek and keep seeking. Knock and keep knocking and it will be open to you and you will have those things you ask for. So we're going to pray today and as I look at a, a crowd this size, I, I know already there are so many different needs represented today in each of our lives. Some spiritual needs healing, forgiveness, redemption. Maybe someone would be here today that you even have a need of salvation. But I know there's many practical needs, needs of healing, needs of comfort, financial needs, interpersonal relationships that you just can't solve it from your side of the table. But can we raise the level of faith for a few moments and pray together? How many of you would just be honest and say, you know what, I'm not asking you to come up and tell us about it, but how many of you would say, I've got a need in my life. I, I, need, I need Jesus to meet a need in my life. Yeah, several of us. Can we stand today and just honor the presence of Jesus one more time in this room? I want to ask our prayer team to come and find your place in the altar area here. and Some of the team is coming to the, the middle aisle there. They are here just to partner with you. Just to believe with you. So if you're here today and you say, I've got a need in my life, whatever it might be, this is your cue. I want to invite you as I pray from the platform, would you just step out from where you are and let one of these men or women of God pray for you? We want to just believe with you today that God's going to do it. Father, right now, as your people, we stand in reverence and in honor of your presence. We acknowledge you are here you are in our midst. And Jesus, we believe you see. And your heart goes out to your people today. Jesus, you said in your word that there's not a sparrow that falls from the sky that our heavenly father doesn't see. And he cares way more for us than for the birds of the air. Jesus, you said even the hairs of our head are numbered by the Lord. You are so attuned to our lives. 
I pray someone today be reminded the Lord sees you. He sees you. His heart goes out to you. Maybe you're here today and you feel like your hopes are being laid in the grave. But he sees you and his heart goes out to you. And he's still speaking today. God, right now, by the power of your spirit, would you speak a word to your people? A word of affirmation. A word of comfort. A word to edify them. Lord, even use my lips today, Jesus, to be your servant to speak life and not death over situations that look like they're headed to a grave. Thank you, Jesus, that you come to your people by the power of your Holy Spirit. You said, never will I leave you or forsake you. Come now, Spirit of Jesus. Fill our hearts, fill our lives with your presence. And God, I pray for someone today that might be in this service or maybe just watching online. You feel like you've been too far from God, too far gone. You're in the wrong timing, in the wrong place. You feel like that Syrophoenician woman who you've prayed before and you got nothing but silence. God, I pray today that their faith would rise to believe anything is possible. Just a crumb of grace, Lord Jesus. Would you, just, would you just begin to reveal your goodness to them today? And Lord, I pray today for those of us that, that feel just weary in well-doing. Paul said, don't grow weary in well-doing for in due time you will reap a harvest if you faint not. But some of us, we, we feel like we're, we're going to faint in our faith because we've prayed and we've prayed and we've asked and we've cried out and we haven't gotten the answer but God I pray today for fresh faith for eyes of faith that we would be reminded the only appropriate response to an unanswered prayer is to pray again that we would come with a shameless audacity To stand on the doormat of prayer and knock and seek and ask and believe, Lord Jesus, that you're going to show up and you're going to meet the needs that we have. We come to you by faith in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people said amen. Amen. Come on, if you believe he can do it, let's give him praise like it's already done. Like it's already done. Thank you, Lord God.